so many people. So many people spread around the church. It's a wonderful sight. Welcome today to St. James for this memorial service for Andy. For those who don't know me, my name is Lucy Holt and I'm rector here at St. James. But welcome also to those who are joining us remotely too via our live streaming um, Facebook channel. And um, it will be, um, if you want to, to watch it again later, um, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later as well, which you can access via our website. Very unusually and very surprisingly, if you knew Andy's organisational skills, he'd left instructions on what he might want to celebrate his life on a day such as today. And we're meeting these instructions all but one, and that is the location here. He had wanted us to go to Parkstone URC, where he'd found a spiritual home in the last few years. What Pat Parkstone lacks, though, that St James's has is simply the size and capacity. And perhaps Andy, um, when saying this, hadn't quite realised the impact that his life had had on so many people and how many people would want to celebrate it together. Covid might have given us another curveball on this again, but we're able to be safe here um, with so many people and spread out. So we're here at St James, a place where Bob and Melanie and his dad and mum had a significant ministry and where Andy too started to explore his own ministry. The whole family is still much loved here and Andy only a few years ago led a parish weekend for us as a church family from St James down in Sidmouth. So though, though we're not at Perk, it's fitting that we come here today and I'm also handing over in a minute to Andy's good friend, John Good, who's taking the service for us today. Here at St. James, we still have our Christmas tree up. And uh, you'll still see nativity scenes around in various places of the church as we are still well within the Christmas season. A season that reminds us each year of the amazing incarnation of Jesus that he shared the joys and sorrows of earthly life. And today we can remember with joy and his life, and we might want to smile and even laugh at times as we think about him. But also today we may want to shed a tear or many as we think of life without Andy. But we do this in the assurance that he is safely now in God's presence for eternity because of his faith and trust in Jesus, who came to dwell among us the first Christmas and then conquered death through his cross and resurrection. So before I hand over to John, let's just stop and pray for a moment. God of hope, you give us hope in the coming of your Son to dwell amongst us. We come to you in shock and grief and confusion of heart at the death of your dear child Andy, who meant so much to so many people and who was so faithful in following you. Help us to find peace in the knowledge of your loving mercy to us all and give us your light to guide us out of places of darkness into the assurance of your amazing and indescribable love shown through your son jesus christ in whose name we now pray amen well Thank you, Lucy, for welcoming, uh, welcoming us all into the, the church. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We're all here today as family, as friends, as colleagues of the inimitable Andy Mason. We gather to celebrate his life, his character, his big heart, and his legacy. And we also come to commit him and ourselves into God's loving care. 
My name is John Good. Uh, I'm a pioneer Baptist minister here in Poole. I got to know Andy well over the last three years, and it's an honour to be leading this service. Uh, I, like many of you, were shocked to hear of Andy's accident, and I am probably still in that place. So as we come today, we all need to prepare ourselves for God's loving and gracious work as he gently carries us from shock and disbelief into and towards the work of grief. And as he carries Andy into unspeakable joy with himself in heaven. We all come here today with feelings, things left unsaid, and questions. Nobody arrives here today intact. And I wanted to say that all of that is welcome here. It's okay to feel like that. So for us, the broken-hearted, the mourners, the co-conspirators, the prayer warriors, and all those with questions and something to say, for family, for those who have lost a son, a friend, or a father, and for Andy, I wanted to start by reading a promise as a way to find some ground to stand on and some light for the way ahead. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 38, and it says, For I am convinced that there is nothing in death, nor life, in the realms of spirits or superhuman powers, in the world as it is, or the world as it should be, in the forces of the universe, in height or depth, there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. God, we come to you all wrapped up in a life that shouldn't have ended so soon. Uh, we come gutted and broken and hurting. But we thank you that your death and your resurrection mean that this is not the end. It's not the end for Andy. And it's not the end for us. Your resurrection means that the worst thing is never the last thing. Holy Spirit, please come and breathe hope into us. The people in Andy's life left behind. Help us as we worship to let you draw near into all of those places inside of us which are hurting and broken and begin your healing and loving work. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Let's stand, if we're able to, to sing our first song. And he chose this himself, as Lucy mentioned, and it speaks to the central part of Andy's faith in Christ. Oh, 
that Andy was on his way back to Paul when he had his accident was to launch his book, this book, Meeting Brendan in Birmingham. You hold up a copy? You've got a copy already? Hold it up. It's great to see so many. Uh, it's all about a two-week trip uh, that he went on in, uh, visiting inspirational Christian projects across the UK. But it's more than that, really. It's a springboard for his thoughts and his reflections on God, Christian uh, life, and ministry. The book is great, and Andy was rightly proud of it, and he was looking forward to it getting out in the world. The family thought that it would be fitting for him uh, for it to form part of the service today, so that you can all hear at least a couple of his thoughts in his own words. More than that, uh, there are copies of the book still available uh, for free at the back of the building after the service is finished. Let's make this the launch that Andy wanted to see. If you do take a copy though, don't take one because you're at Andy's funeral. Take one because it is a thoughtful and an inspirational read. The next part of the service will run as per the order that you have in your hands. Thanks to everybody taking part. So if you see your name on the service sheet, please come up to the front at that time. Many thanks. Over to Dave. Thank you, John. I'm Dave Pegg and I work for the Pace Trust, working in the schools in Bournemouth Pool and Christchurch. And I had the privilege and pleasure of working with Andy in recent years in the schools. And I'm just going to read a short section from the book uh, called Grit, the Missing Element. He says, I went to the pub with my friend, Pastor Benson. It was great to catch up with him, watching him spoon sugar generously into his coffee. He had arrived in Kingswood a couple of years earlier with instructions from his church leader to plant a church in Bristol, and that's how I got to know him. Pastor B tried planting a church in the conference room of the Soundwell swimming baths, although I joked that they meet in the shallow end of the pool, before moving into the city centre, into the Holiday Inn as a venue for their church. He now has a small fellowship meeting regularly there. I asked how his church started, and he had one word, grit, keeping on going. Each Saturday, they went out onto the streets and invited people to come. Anyone doing much street work knows what hard and thankless task this can be. Each Sunday, they set up with tea and coffee, waiting for people as they prayed, worshipped and sought God. It took seven or eight weeks before anyone other than his family came and joined them. Yet they kept on going. They didn't quit and the church was born. He said to me on, some, on Saturday, 
He said, it doesn't say, well done, gifted servant, or well done, successful servant, but rather, well done, good and faithful servant. We just had to be faithful. Yet thinking about this, it's amazing how quickly Christians scarper from the battlefield. They may all be noisy in the barracks before the battle, and maybe around for the first charge, but many of us fall short of faithfully having the grit and determination to stand firm, as Ephesians says, keeping going with what God has called us to do. We should be holding the line in obedience, not wandering off on distracting vanity projects, nor fleeing the battle front line for a safer option. Let's be people of grit, of determination and perseverance. Scripture is full of heroes that kept on going, that remained faithful. Gritty characters who persevered. Noah building the ark. Moses leading the people through the desert. Esther in prayer. Ruth in her commitment to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Daniel in righteous living. Nehemiah in rebuilding the wall. And Paul in the proclamation of the gospel. Yet our greatest example of grit and determination is Jesus who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus did not quit on his father's mission, even when his sweat fell like drops of blood, even when it cost him everything he had, including his life. Jesus remained faithful unto death, even death on the cross. I believe the secret to transformation in mission is not more courses, nor new programs and ideas, but rather greater grit, more steadfastness, keeping going and pressing in to see the harvest. Everyone, my name's Mark. And after joint privilege, you know Andy uh, for over 30 years. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we give you so much thanks for Andy's life. We thank you for his love for you, his family, his friends, your church, and people everywhere he went. We thank you for his caring nature, his generosity, his openness, his perseverance, his faithfulness his sense of humour, his love for life and his passion for real ale. We thank you for every precious memory we have of him, for all the times of laughter and fun, for every sorrow and hardship shared. We thank you for the passion he had for you and for your kingdom and for his desire to see justice, mercy and equality. We thank you especially for the heart he had for those who were suffering, oppressed, marginalised and lowly. We thank you so much for all that you enabled him to do and for the many lives he inspired and impacted. For those he helped find faith in you. For those he helped through hard times. For those he helped in ministry and mission. For those he helped through the street pastors. For those he helped in schools and for those he helped through food projects. We thank you so much for all he was and all you enabled him to do and be. Hear our prayers of thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, we pray for those who mourn, for those gathered here today and for any thinking of us afar. And we especially pray for Bob and Mel and Elena and Hope. We ask that you'd help them and those who mourn, cast all their cares and sorrows onto you, knowing that you love us and long to comfort us. We ask in our sadness and confusion and shock at Andy's untimely death that you'd help us to see your good hand at work And you'd help us find peace in the knowledge that Andy is now with you, free from all the pain and suffering and injustices of this world. We thank you that he rests securely in your everlasting arms, and we praise you that this rest is secure because Jesus died and rose again to save us. Please may Jesus' death and resurrection lead us on in faith and give us the assurance of your love 
and a hope of eternal life. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, Andy longed to see your kingdom come, and we close by praying that prayer now. We ask that in our own lives your kingdom would come, and that we would act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. We pray that we would follow Andy's example as he followed the example of Jesus, and that we would be a people who long to see your name proclaimed, honoured and glorified. We pray this not only for ourselves, but for our churches, our communities, our country and for this world. Father, we ask that justice would roll like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream across the whole earth and that many lives would be changed and transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit as people come to know what Andy knew and passionately believed in, that you are the one true God who loves us and has rescued us in your Son, and that by trusting in him we can know you and have fullness of life. We ask all these things for the glory and honour of your name. Amen.
Hi, my name's Mark and I have the honour of being one of many of Andy's friends and the privilege of working with him on numerous projects at Parkstone United Reformed Church. Andy's family asked me to read a small extract from his book, which by the way is fantastic and I would wholeheartedly uh, recommend. <coughs> The irony that it was, that was that it was the last time that I saw Andy before the accident um, was for a pint or two uh, in a pub just a stone's throw from this church. Amongst other things, we took time to reflect on the book, which I was earnestly and eagerly ploughing through at the time. The extract that I am about to read comes from a section entitled, What Does Success Look Like? I heard a story once about a king who was not very good at archery. Whenever he shot an arrow, his servants would find it and paint a bullseye and a target around his arrow to make him feel successful. Sometimes a similar approach has happened in churches in, and in other organisations too, where we pretend that everything that happens is a success, irrespective of the reality. Yet I have discovered it is often in the pain of disappointment that, that this has been the catalyst for prayer, reflection and greater creativity. Being honest about something, not working, allows us to try something different. Whenever I've had a vicar job interview, I've asked, what does success look like in this context? Rarely has there been a very good response. It's a great question. What is success and how do you measure it? Success is often linked to our vision and our values, our goals, plans and strategies. And this leads us to ask whether our values, plans and strategies are the same as God's. Are we measuring the things that he cares about? When I was a vicar, I used to get frustrated with people asking me how big my church was, clearly linking numbers with spiritual health, forgetting that obesity is a form of growth too. <laughs> and that on at least one occasion, the crowd left Jesus in droves as they found him too challenging. As I wrestled with my own thinking around success and failure, I came up with this definition of success. When the call of God is matched by our faithful obedience in seeking, seeking to bring our whole lives lived under the Lordship of Jesus. Amen. The reading that Andy wanted read was uh, from Philippians chapter 1 and it's from uh, verse 18 through to 27. Paul was in prison and he writes, Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your, uh, your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that in no way will I be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live 
is Christ. And to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but I know it's necessary for you that I remain in the body. I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your, uh, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Andy's chosen words were those uh, words right in the middle there. <clears throat> for to me, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I turned up to Andy's leaving party in Poole after it had been going a couple of hours. It was at a bar on the quay, and Andy was looking happy, but I could tell that he had been talking with people non-stop. He gave me a hug like I was the first person there, and he ushered me over to a seat. He introduced me to some of the folk that I didn't know, and he made sure I was settled with a drink. I stayed until the end, and as I walked home that evening, I wondered to myself whether I had been to any other leaving do where the host had so graciously invited a mixture of clergy, friends, family, and homeless folk. All were welcome, and all were treated exactly the same. Andrew John Mason, or the self-titled Scruffy Vicar, was born to Bob and Mel in Reading on the 29th of July, 1977. He was born into the faith, and being the son of a vicar, the family moved around a lot, first Oxfordshire, then North London, where, in Hertfordshire, before spending his teenage years in Eastbourne, where he got himself an MBQ in health and social care. Significantly, it was here that he reignited his own faith in Jesus Christ. A young lady by the name of Samantha passed away at 19 years old. And Mace writes on page 41 of his book, he says it was a painful process. Sam died in September and it was the next Easter day when I finally surrendered. I gave in and rededicated my life to God. I remember using the phrase, I don't want to play at being a Christian. I want to follow Jesus for real. And I think you'd agree it's safe to say that Andy never again did play at following Jesus. His passion for the Lord grew while in Eastbourne. He shared a flat with a friend called Andy Evers. And Evers wrote to, uh, to Andy's father, Bob, recently and he said this about their time together. He said, Andy made me the man I am today. He was the light in my darkness and it was him who led me back to Jesus. If it wasn't for the kindness and love that he showed me, I don't know where I'd be today. By the time he was 21, Andy was living in Poole, and by the time he was 24, he was leading the pace of Christian schools work here. He'd started an alcohol-free nightclub for teenagers called The Area, and things were building up for him to follow in his father's footsteps and train for ordained ministry. He married Elena in 2007 in this very church, and together they moved to Kingswood in Bristol to begin ministry together. And he planted initiatives there, including a new church plant and a city centre branch of street pastors. And in 2011, Elena gave birth to their daughter. Hope Sienna Rose Mason was born. <laughs> and Andy's life changed forever. He was 
is and always will be besotted with her. His time in Bristol wasn't always the easiest. And while there, <clears throat> Andy struggled with demands of ministry and the challenges of catering for different people's needs. Ready for a change, he applied to vicar another church in Southsea, but he didn't make it to the position. And eventually the family returned to Paul in 2017 to recoup and work out what might be next. Andy resigned from parish ministry and took up a master's with CMS and got a job with Pace. His passion for monastic life and helping people to follow Jesus led him to start two more projects here. The Paul New Monastics with Parkstone URC and uh, the School of Mission. Both examples of his creative urge to see people live differently under Christ. I got to know Andy here in Paul. He was the first person to have a pint with me on the quay when we moved here. He prayed with us every Thursday in the park and I would occasionally look round sheepishly as he prayed so loudly and flailed his arms all over the place. <laughs> he was big hearted, sharing any time and money that he had with others. He had a ready laugh, often recounting tales of trouble that he had with mates like Chris Harwood, Dave Smith and AJ. He was also very enterprising. He had 20 ideas most days and would have loved to have made them all happen at the same time before breakfast. I remember him uh, and the family dog, Teddy, dropping by when I was painting a room that I, uh, I used for a project. He offered to help and within 10 minutes had covered himself completely in paint and he'd let his dog, Teddy, walk through the tray and make paw prints all over the floor. <laughs> Luckily, he did get some paint on the walls. But Andy, like the rest of us, was complicated. We are all beautiful hairballs, aren't we? A mixture of good, weird, wonderful. We are intriguing, broken, lost and found, and in conversation with ourselves the whole time. A couple of years ago, after a health scare, Andy left a note with his wishes should he ever die, and he wrote that this talk, the eulogy, should contain, and I quote, the unvarnished truth, include addre including addressing depression and possible ADHD, the pain of South Sea, and my wrestles and doubts. No doubt Andy did face battles. He compared himself to other people, and he was able to hold on to the pain of past rejections as if they happened yesterday. Sometimes the space inside his head was such a difficult place to be, the pain was channeled to places it shouldn't have gone. And he had other things. He could focus on one area of life to such an extent that he almost forgot that there were other people and other areas of life which also needed attending to. He asked questions about the nature of heaven and hell. He often ch uh, challenged the workings of church life and mused over ways that Christian life could be done differently. He lamented, truly, when God didn't answer his prayers and when he felt all alone. He wanted you to know that he isn't a saint. He would want you to know that he was a normal guy. He was a Christian hairball, like many of us. He had successes and he faced challenges. But one thing was for sure, he didn't play at following Jesus. Maybe that's why he chose this verse, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Because following Jesus means that we place the whole of our lives, the whole hairball, inside of his life, the death and the resurrection of Christ, the whole thing goes in. And when we do that, 
It's Jesus who sifts through it and he uses the whole thing. Everything. He has taken all of Andy's accomplishments, the groups that he started, the wisdom that he shared and the churches he's planted, the school of mission, the Paul New monastics, and he's used it all to grow his own kingdom and touch people's lives. And he also takes the depression, the people and the projects who felt left behind, the questions and the doubts in Andy's life, and he turns them into me too's. So that when Andy met people who were down, he didn't give them Christian answers. He got into the pit with them. When he met people who had failed and weren't successful, he knew the same pain that they did. And when he found genuine seekers asking questions about life and death and who had unanswered prayers and who felt alone, he wasn't always prepared to give an answer for the hope that he had. But instead, he was able to open the wound that he lived with and invite people in. If to live is Christ, then sometimes people see our A game and other people see our bloody scars. But then, then, to die is gain. There is, thankfully, a resolution. A wrapping up to the complexities and the pain of human nature. And he knew that one day his mind would someday calm, that his questions would be answered, and that whatever gave him unquenchable restlessness would finally be satisfied. He knew that in earthly death there would be the resurrection to brand new life, where he would meet with Jesus, who would tend and care for him. One rabbi's interpretation of the Hebrew word shalom is may all your pieces fit perfectly together. And St Paul knew that when writing this letter, just like when Moses never quite got to see the promised land, we on earth never quite see the complexities of this life resolved. There were many things in where he felt constrained and, uh, which abil- uh, inabil- and inhibited sorry, his ability to experience consistent joy. But now, and he is with Jesus himself, having all of those pieces, everything put back together, perfectly, lovingly, gently. Arriving in heaven at the same time that Hope and Elena saw a shooting star. And as Andy Biddlecombe said, who else gets to heaven like that? Perhaps when you think of Andy, think about what we read earlier, or what was read earlier. He embodied his own teachings about grit and perseverance in the gospel. He also saw success as faithfulness rather than numbers or achievements. Think of the people whose lives have been affected through his teaching and his living out of the gospel. I think that Paul's next words would chime with what he too would want to urge all of you. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Live fully, ask questions, but Andy's life says to me, don't play at following Jesus. Give to him the whole hairball of your life and watch in wonder 
at what he might do with it. Let's pray. Father God, we give to you our whole selves as we give Andy to you. And we thank you that it was a life fully lived and that it was a life fully lived in you. Lord, in the work of grief, would your spirit move into those uh, places in our own hearts and in our our own minds where we too need to experience death and resurrection. May you inspire hope joy and peace and goodness from Andy's life, from your word and from yourself as we move forward. Amen. Let's stand to sing another song that Andy uh, chose himself. There's a place where the street shines. There's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there, we can live there, be on time. Because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. No more pain, no more sadness, no more suffering, no more tears. No more sin, no more sickness, no injustice, no more death because of you. Because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. Sins are washed away, and we can live forever. Now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face, and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. There is joy everlasting, there is sadness, there is peace. There is wine ever flowing, there is wedding, there's a feast because of you. Because of you, because of your love, because of your love. The city of our God because of you. Do take a seat. Just before we finish, there are a couple of things that uh, I'd like to say. That firstly, the family would love you afterwards to join them for refreshments, and they'll be held over at Skinner Street United Reform Church on uh, Skinner Street. <laughs> Please, sorry, but it's off Laglin Street. Please do come along. Uh, and if you'd like to give towards the cost of, uh, of the funeral, if you'd like to make a donation, Andy himself asked that any donations uh, should be given to his good friend uh, Chris Harwood's project called Restore Cumbria. It's an amazing project and Andy believed wholeheartedly in it. So please do make a donation to them. There's, uh, I think there's a bowl towards the back of the church building. Uh, if not, I think there's a QR code and, or a web link on the back of your order of service that you can give to 
directly. The project is amazing. Now, to finish, I wanted to pray a Franciscan blessing over us, which uh, Andy, Andy himself loved, St Francis. So I hope it inspires and encourages all of us. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, exploitation of people, so that you may work tirelessly for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with the tears, uh, the gift of tears, to shed with those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world, so that you're able, with God's grace, to do what others, uh, what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God, the supreme majesty, and our creator, Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, who is our brother and saviour, and the Holy Spirit, our advocate and guide, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.